Today I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning and musical layout. Um, so it, it's the um, uh, same topic as Dominique's talk, but uh, a bit more of a deep dive into one particular thing. Um, in hopes that for those of you who are interested in musical layout and musical scores, um, that it, it provides some value. So first a bit about me. Uh, I am the CEO of a Helsinki-based company called Mishkan uh, that mostly legally reverse engineers software. So uh, uh, I had uh, the, the brief story about this is um, I was working at a place called the Earcom in Paris uh, that does um, computer music, and in the context of my work there, started experimenting um, with using AI to reverse engineer systems. Uh, it was sound systems, but those algorithms kind of took wing. Uh, I found some investors that were interested in investing in it, um, and currently uh, we use AI to reverse engineer kind of production systems that are so incomprehensible that nobody could re-engineer them, so reverse engineering them is, is cheaper and more efficient. Uh, and you'd be amazed how many businesses in the world uh, need that. So we're hiring, I'll just put that in parentheses, but it's, it's going quite well. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on if you like or dislike my music, I've been out of music for the past two or three uh, years. His um, music is great! <laughs> uh, um, but uh, doing uh, li little projects here and there, um, but my heart's really in it, I absolutely love it, but a big thanks to Werner for inviting me to this. This is the first talk I've done on, on anything musical in like three or four years. Um, worked a lot on Lillipot and Guido about ten years ago. Um, also a direct ensemble, we do like one to two gigs a year. Our next one will be at uh, CES 2021 in Vegas, if, if anybody wants to come all the way to Vegas to, to, to see crazy music. Um, yeah. So. What is machine learning? Um, so I will give my uh, totally opinionated, biased definition of it. Uh, I would love for somebody afterwards to, to call me out on it, but this is just what I think it is after years of pulling around with it. So you randomly generate mostly linear equations with tens and thousands of variables. So if, if you took you know linear algebra in school, I um, mean you remember you know um, uh, a x plus b y equals something, just that longer and the matrix is bigger. Um, and randomly generated, and then you construct a loss function. So if x and y are the data that you know, and a and b are the weights that you don't, uh, there's some type of loss function that guides a and b to what they need to be. So using these equations, you construct a loss function um, and find its hopefully global minimum. Um, so we'll talk about what minima and maxima are using input data and targets. Um, and then uh, we use this minimum, hopefully global, to make predictions about new input data. So essentially we use uh, uh, calculus that you learn in high school early, uh, in, in machine learning, none of the math that I've seen at least uh, goes beyond what you learn in late high school, early college, calculus, uh, finding a minimum of equation and then that's the equation that's used to make uh, future predictions about phenomena. And we'll see what these things are in a second. So this is machine learning. How many of you guys have ever seen uh, something like this, like a, a straight up linear regression? So good. Um, so if you could do this, then, then you could do machine learning. So here, the machine has learned uh, um, that, so what you've told it is all machine learning has assumptions. The assumption behind this model is that it's linear. So you've told the machine that. From that, the machine tries to minimize, so when I talk about a local minima, it's trying to minimize the distance between the line and the dots. Um, and it's doing it here uh, analytically, so meaning that here, um, because uh, the, the way to find the minima is least squares, so a, a, a function um, in one dimension, a, a quadratic function in one dimension has an easily known analytic solution, meaning that you don't need uh, to do anything iterative, you can just solve it by hand or use a computer-based solver, um, like even MATLAB and Octave have those things these days. However, in more complex problems, so here there's two dimensions, but now imagine a dimension heading out towards y'all, and we'll have three, and now imagine a hundred thousand, if your brain is uh, capable of that, mine isn't, but, and then you would have uh, then you'd have machine learning. So uh, in, in um, an average machine learning problem, there's about 100,000 uh, weights. This has one, the um, uh, x-axis and the prediction is y. So uh, that's, um, no analytic method can solve uh, that type of optimization function. So instead, we do iteration, um, which is just trial and error. So the way that iteration would work is you can imagine this line, imagine that somebody, oh, uh, this has a, um, yeah, I just don't want to press the wrong button and blow everything up, but that is the pointer. So 
Uh, imagine that you chose this line at first and it wasn't right, and then you nudged it to something that's kind of here, it wasn't right, and then eventually you got here. In this case, that would be overkill, but what um, kind of real-world machine learning is does that, basically. Nudges the line around uh, until it gets to a sweet spot um, that is just bad enough to slightly disappoint every single data point, uh, but, just, <laughs> but just good enough on the whole to, to kind of make sense uh, more often than, than not. So, um, a slightly different example, one thing I love doing for fun uh, uh, in, in seminars is uh, using machine learning to recreate things like addition, subtraction, so essentially using data like 1-1 one, one is the data and 2 is the output, or 1-2 is the data and 3 is the output. So if, if you have a million of those, you could teach the machine how to add, which is one of the, like, you know, it's a terrible use of GPU in time, but you could probably do it. Um, so another one you could do is XOR. So if you're used to Boolean logic, uh, XOR, so in the XOR operation, true and true is uh, false. Um, false and false is false, true and false is true, and false and true is true. And I love XORs just because to me it's, life is like this, that if something is too good to be true, it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> if it's really bad, it's also probably not, but this is kind of where the sweet spot is. <laughs> um, so I use it. Uh, so, um, let's see how a machine learning algorithm can classify uh, XOR. So this is straight from the documentation of, of uh, Keras. So, this is the training data, um, uh, true, true, false, false, and then the opposites, and this is uh, the target data. So, we create, um, what Dominique had talked about, and I'll talk about in a little bit, is what's called the dense neural network, where basically everything is connected uh, to everything else. That's usually a terrible idea in neural networks, I'll tell you why, and then I'll, I'll speak about what this activation is. Basically, this random cuts off certain pathways, and if you think about the brain, not all neurons are connected to all neurons, otherwise we'd be really smart. But thankfully, <laughs> thanks to evolution and alcohol, some neurons are not connected to other neurons. And uh, that, that's, um, uh, that's recreated with this thing called ReLU, and then you compile the model, uh, and then you fit um, the training data to the target data, uh, and this will actually get really high accuracy. So if, if, uh, if I did it here, it, it would get um, over 99% accuracy on XOR, which, uh, if you're not using machine learning, you can um, do with, with uh, circuits or, or many other more simple things. But this is just an example of how these uh, modern libraries can, um, uh, in Python, very succinctly uh, encapsulate certain phenomena. So why is this called learning, but why not machine doing or machine stuff? So this is kind of how we learn, kind of. So some systems of equations, like the one on the previous slide, are inspired by, but only loosely modeled on neural networks in the brain. Um, so it's more poetic than anything else. And the other one, and this is my, uh, my bet, is it sounds, sounds impressive. There's this great quote that I learned that Machine learning is done with Python, and artificial intelligence is learned with, done with PowerPoint. <laughs> I think that in general, um, at some point in my late twenties, early thirties, like computer programming and programmers in general and nerds got sexy, which is like fantastic. <laughs> Thirty years, we were totally geeks, but somebody got interested in us. I haven't met these people yet, but at least theoretically. <laughs> They give these people lots of money to, to make, make companies and stuff. So, um, mine being one of them. So, the, uh, uh, it, it sounds impressive to call it machine learning because then, you know, the machines learn and maybe one day they'll take over us and we could all retire somewhere warmer than, than here. So, when does ML make sense? Um, this is, again, my personal, totally subjective criteria. When there's no easily grokkable model underlying the process. So, at XOR, we all kind of get how it works. Uh, addition, we all kind of grok how it works. But if, um, you can't say uh, exactly what's going on succinctly and describe it to, to a three-year-old, let alone yourself, then machine learning is probably a candidate. Also, when the process yields sensible results with a few outliers, I should have augmented this, that machine learning is also excellent when the process yields totally nonsensical results, because if it's Gaussian noise, then that's the easiest thing to model in, in the world. Um, so, but, uh, uh, on the other side, if there's you know a general um, a distribution of what's considered acceptable, uh, and um, uh, yeah, in the Western canon. So uh, yesterday, when Daniel was talking about Dorico, you gave a I forget what the, the, the range was, but 1720-ish to 1910-ish, when when people kind of agreed on what they were doing 
in a very small part of the world on music notation. That, that, that's, um, those sensible results are encoded into things like Lilypond and Guido, and I'll show that in a little bit. Um, and then when there's a ton of data. So, does ML make sense in musical layout? Yes. Uh, so first, there's no single unified model underlying musical layout, meaning that there's no easily grokkable process to lay out a score. Um, not that I know, at least, and if there were, then I, 10 years of my computational life would have been down the drain. So I hope that there's not one, one easy model, and that all those <laughs> algorithms I wrote uh, actually meant something to, to somebody. Um, then, uh, classical engraving is really hard to get right, um, but it's rarely shocking or unpredictable. So usually when you get it right, it's kind of the opposite. It's, it's totally unshocking and totally predictable, even though it's really hard. And then there's tons of data. Um, so Dominique was talking about this before, but we know the context of elements in traditional engraving, where they're placed and as um, optical recognition gets better, um, we can even find more of it. And the example I did, um, I did machine learning only on lily pond scores, so basically I've created a little brain of Conway who's sitting, <laughs> <laughs> who's sitting right there. Um, but, you know, there, there's other engravers besides him in, in the world, and uh, you, can, you can get us separated with, with OKR. So, um, case study, slurs and lily pond. So, uh, lily pond, I'm going to get to why, I, um, why slurs in a bit, um, but here's why I think it's a prime candidate. So. Uh, Lilypond has over 20 exposed and 100 internal variables it uses for slur layout, um, many of which are interdependent in ways we don't understand. So uh, uh, we'll see that in a second. So while Lilypond usually produces a sensible outcome, no one really gets why or how it does this. Um, Lilypond is, is too uh, complicated and too baroque um, to understand uh, in every single case why it works. Meaning you, you could look through the logs and kind of figure it out, but uh, by naked eye, uh, at least I don't know anybody that that knows this. Um, so in other words, it's tantamount to a black box and more or less as opaque as, uh, as machine learning, which is also a black box. And slurs in classical engraving provide tons of data. So using OKR, we can amass a corpus of millions of slurs placements, the target, where it is physically on the page, and even more importantly, the objects influencing their placement input data. So here, we're encoding a little bit of bias, meaning my bias, my assumption, is that where note heads are influence where a slur is. You can tell me that I'm... I'm wrong, I would disagree with you. Um, there, there's certain objects on the page that influence where a slur is, <coughs> whereas there's certain objects um, that don't. Some do, like the composer's name might influence where a slur is on the first line of a soprano part of, of, of music, but that's quite esoteric, so we throw those things out. Um, then, uh, again, in Lily Pons, there's six different substantive authors, including uh, uh, myself and Han Wen, uh, spending 15 years, uh, most of whom have never uh, met, let alone talked to each other, and then also it's poorly documented for both users and coders. So this is another place where machine learning can make sense. Um, if, uh, um, uh, if there's a case where there's been a lot of organic growth um, in, in software. So here's an example of kind of what, what, what the sausage, or how it's made. So when I say over 20 interdependent variables, how many people can grok what steeper slope factor has to do with slurs? <laughs> No, I, yeah. <laughs> and, and who could forget everybody's favorite extra encompass collision distance? Not to be confused with extra encompass free distance. <laughs> um, I, 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 I joke about it. I'm totally guilty of adding like five of these like ten years ago. I, I, I really do. Um, edge slope exponent. Does this mean exponent like a noun, like somebody who is for the edge slope, like rah rah? I'm an exponent. Um, absolute closeness measure. I, I have absolutely no idea. So, so um, this is what I mean by the twenty uh, things that you could tweet. Um, maybe if Daniel worked for Lily Pong, he would have designed beautiful images of what they all mean. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, no, nobody knows, so that's, uh, or no, we know, but I mean, it's, it's unfortunately poorly documented. And then on top of this, if this were all that were in the code base, that would be one thing, but then um, slurs are grubs, graphical objects in Lily Pond. So there's also these things, like um, it's thickness, uh, vertical skylines, which I'll be talking about a little bit in tomorrow's unconference, which I'll try to make as un as possible, um, more on than this. Then direction of the slur, um, and like various other things that course go into, into layout. Um, and then, uh, sorry for this, but I thought it was important. So this is some of the C++ code. Um, so this is the code that avoids a staff line for slurs. So again, we're thinking about what the algorithm looks like. So here, these are just publicly available um, variables, but already in this algorithm, this 
is a decision. It's a decision that's not controlled by a public variable, but um, we care um, uh, about something about the extremes equaling each other. I'd have to dive into it to figure out what it means more. Um, there's a to-do, meaning that it doesn't quite do uh, one particular thing. Yet, um, and then here, this 3.0 um, and this 1.0 come from uh, uh, a Bezier uh, um, algorithm, but these are magic numbers. So these magic numbers could have theoretically at least been exposed um, uh, to a user. And again, this two times, it's ubiquitous over the Lepon code base, but again, this could have been exposed to a user. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that all of these publicly exposed variables are, are um, complemented by a myriad of private variables. And if we scroll down more, um, we could see, yeah, even more. So like this, this here, again, this, um, and this is just to avoid a slur line in Lollipop, and, and these are the decisions that are being made. So, um, uh, yeah, I say this um, just to, to show kind of the complexity of the thing when humans try to learn it uh, in, instead of machines. Yeah, um, so uh, what if, instead of doing this, um, we uh, try to use machine learning, what affordances would that give us and what problems would creep up? So now I'll talk about kind of how uh, I would do it if I had um, uh, more time. So uh, this is um, a Clara Schumann piece, it's Suave Musical, her Opus 6, and it, uh, it's a beautiful piece, but also has lots of, lots of slurs, so I, I chose to put it in the presentation. So a uh, little read about slurs, so one, two, three, four, uh, five, so all sorts of goodies. There's a broken slur, um, there's a slur that potentially collides with the note head, there's um, uh, various uh, beaming slopes, there's articulations, um, different rhythmic values, so uh, already this line alone has like lo lots of goodness um, for, for uh, how slurs can be different and the things that affect them. Um, uh, so I would use, uh, sorry I put o OCR, to identify the um, uh, square elements including slurs, and then encode metadata if known, so including the composer, instruments, engraver, date of composition, date of engraving. So this is just building the data set. Um, so uh, we would identify what these things are and have the metadata available uh, to then pass to the model. So I'm not talking about what the actual computation is yet, but just what kind of has to be in the model. So what I'm throwing out is all the stuff that I deem does not have to do with slurs. So for example, I would um, identify uh, that these elements have no bearing on the slurs placement and then um, and throw them out in, in a data pre-processing step. However, uh, the way that I made this slur data set, um, in kind of the way that I've done a lot of Lillipond experiments over the years, so I, um, Lillipond has an input link, or a, a, what's it called, um, processing uh, extension, extension language called uh, 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 Scheme. So uh, I just use Scheme to override the print function and then print to the console just like a bunch of coordinates of stuff. Take it, um, grep the logs, turn it into a CSV file, and then take the bounding box variable for the print elements, and then we have our input data. So encompass node heads, encompass stems, accidentals, all per node grobs with avoid slur set to inside. So that means like anything that's going to be on the inside of the slur. And then this is the hard part. This is the absolutely uh, super challenging part. So if a slur is avoiding like a, a hairpin or a trill, then it gets tricky because now we're not on a per grab basis, we're on a spanner basis. So that's like, there's always a wrench thrown into the system of musical engraving, and that's the one I found for machine learning um, with, with uh, slur. So I cheated by ignoring it in some of the models, but some of them I did include it. Um, and then the output, uh, in my opinion, could not be any easier. That's kind of nice. The four anchor points for a Bezier curve. So it's a Bezier, that, that's um, eight data points. That's imminently reasonable compared to like facial recognition technology that outputs like a whole image, which is RGB in the space of maybe 144 by 144. So, so computationally, at least, it's, it's not um, the most uh, gourmand thing in the world. Um, so this is just an example, part of an example data. So um, node head 1, x0, node head 1, y0. This is all in staff spaces in Lillipond. Node head 1, x1, node head 1, y1. So just of the, the bounding boxes. Um, the issue with this approach, so let me go back to the Clara Schumann example. Here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six node heads in the example here. There must be eight. There, there's four, uh, three. So um, we have a different number of node heads that could be under slurs. And the, the issue with the machine learning model is there's no oh, five minutes, yeah. there's no such thing as kind of a for loop um, where you could just keep on adding nodes. So unfortunately, what I did was I created kind of uh, um, the Uber slur that has 20 elements and then just like zero padded most of it, but it works. It didn't eat up too much um, computation. 
Power. So uh, I tested these algorithms. I'll skip over what they are. This is the point where, because you only have five minutes left, the, 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 the mad scientist slips over the slides with a bunch of calculus and math. And you're just like, holy shit, he must have done something. This is all intentional to mask my ignorance of the subject. But there's, um, so so uh, random forest and gradient tree boosting, basically what it does is it creates these decision trees and then it applies a multiplier to them um, and randomly drops certain decision trees out. So um, in order to, to choose uh, uh, which one iteratively over time will be kept. Um, so the process kind of iterates and iterates over the data sets, find the decision trees that make the most impactful decisions. So it randomly generates trees, but then it says, oh, this one is actually doing something. And then those trees represent features in the score. Um, and then the last two, so dense neural network, this, um, this here is a bunch of linear algebra, then we randomly drop out some weights, then feed it to more linear algebra. Um, and this can be differentiated thanks to the chain rule. Um, and then uh, the loss function is just a, um, uh, like a least squared function, but uh, differentiated over, over um, the entire network. Um, and then the last one that I tried, uh, I won't even get into what this is doing. Basically, it's a single network um, that feeds its output into the input of the next layer. So it runs the same network on each, um, each unit. And because there's successive node heads, I thought it would be a good idea. It was actually a terrible idea, but um, I read it. So all, all you care about is, maybe is like, what's the winner and how good are the results? So gradient tree boosting one. The crazy part of it is this is literally the code. So meaning that like, in order to calculate the Beziers from the data set, it, it's, it's 10 lines of code um, compared to the, like, I don't know, 10,000 lines, that's exaggeration, 5,000 in the lily pond um, to, to, to calculate slur placement. Um, but it took me a lot to figure out the, the um, gradient boosting regressor to use. Basically, you load the input data, the target test data, and then find the mean squared error. So um, these are two uncanny examples. This is like the Dominique Bach example. But, uh, <laughs> can you tell which one the machine did it? Which one the man did it? <laughs> Somebody's got to put out of a job. <laughs> No, he works at the company that's responsible for creating all this stuff. So, I can't, you know, what, what can I say? so he put himself out of a job. So the um, the uh, so zoom in. what do you say? Can you zoom in? Um, <laughs> I, can't, uh, I don't want to because <laughs> this one you get a little nervous. No, but actually, so it's it's, it's the um, top, and I I I bias the results heavily, meaning that I chose two of them that looked look the best, so some of them are, are, are quite terrible. And also it's heavily pixelated, so uh, there you go. But random forest um, and gradient boosting uh, did really well. So this is mean distance averaged over um, the Bezier control points. Dense and LSTM did terrible. Why is gradient tree boosting effective? I have no idea. In general, <laughs> dense neural nets perform poorly because individual weights do, um, enough work, uh, do too much work. Uh, gradient boosting and random forest are generally more suited to phenomena where there's disparate strands of um, information. And then uh, gotchas, circular dependencies, I have no clue how to deal with them. Computational time is too high. Uh, there's no more tweakable parameters, so we hate those tweakable parameters, except once that are gone, we're like, oh man, I missed that average slur boosting thing. Um, the size of the binary is huge, small number of people that work on this sort of thing, low community enthusiasm, and buzzword phobia. Um, <laughs> lastly, uh, I unfortunately don't have enough bandwidth in the near future. I almost didn't have enough to come to this conference, but thank you, Werner, for convincing me to come. Uh, but because it's, it's fantastic to see you all, and fantastic to meet you for the first time. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to present my doodling. But if anybody would actually like to research this, um, and embarrass me, but with much better results, please do. Uh, this is my email, phone number, and thank you very much for this. I just want to add that uh, this paper will be available soon online. So you can read all these nice details that he omitted in this paper. Uh, I just have to find time to upload it. I'm very sorry I think I'm a bit in delayed. Um, yes, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm really honored to be uh, with the machine learning models. Uh, one thing you did touch on, which is actually so for people that don't know, this first scoring works by just also trying many different, very many different yeah. options for putting the score somewhere and then just giving the score. And it's actually very expensive because you generate many slurs that you're never gonna that will be bad. And so how fast could you make this compared to dumb trying out hundreds of 
So um, computation time, the, the reason that I um, put this here as, as a, a got you is because um, uh, it can get really bad for the big networks, but for the smaller ones, gradient boosting is actually quite fast. Essentially, what LilyPond is doing internally is machine learning on every slur, meaning it creates 100 of them and then finds the best one. So it's a machine learning algorithm in the layout of LilyPond's process. So I mean, I would say this is faster in that the weights are frozen already, so it just, um, I mean, you still need to do the calculation, but you do it once instead of 100. So technically, you use a machine learning model where you have no clue what to do, right? Uh, so in this case, I might already had an idea of what parameters might be interesting. So can your model kind of prove that I went to the, at least the, the right set of parameters to choose from? And can this also speed up your AI model because you already have an idea of what parameters might be important? Yeah, um, so this gets kind of the tweakable parameters thing. So the problem with the gradient boosting algorithm, as I set up, is that it identifies about 100 features, and we have no idea what they are. It's just that it's 100 orthogonal features in 100 dimension space, um, but they may or may not correspond to Hanwen's parameters, and I didn't look into them to, to even see if there's any correlation. That's a big problem. That's probably the biggest problem with this approach, and why I would not recommend it for industrial use at the present uh, moment. Maybe it's the same 100 that's internal. <laughs> that would be, if it were, if it were the exact same 100, I would eat my hat. So. <laughs> Does solving for things like composer name and you know, adjacent staves it dramatically blow up the model? I, um, so that, uh, when I talked about kind of um, uh, those, th those are things that I didn't do, not, not did, so unfortunately, Empirically, I, I can't respond to you, but my guess would be that it, it would just um, get a lot of zeros, basically, or a lot of. Um, so it it, uh, it it blows up the model, but uh, because it's floating point numbers, you get to this uh, explosion or vanishing gradients problem, and then the kind of noise starts creeping in instead of signal. So that's to me why I ruled them out. But it is my own bias that so you'd have to do an experiment to see if it actually matters. Thank you very much. Ten minutes break.